Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the imaging conference. And thank you, Dr. Kasi, for allowing me to present first. And uh, I thought I'd show you what uh, Elva looked like, because I'm sure during the good part of her work, you're not going to see what a real Elva looked like. Anyway, uh, my job here today is to the role of cardiac CT for evaluation of left ventricular assist device. I don't have any disclosure. So this is what we see when we look at in a cardiac CT uh, LVAD, okay? Essentially, you can look at any component, every component of the LVAD, going from the pump, the inflow cannula, and the outflow cannula. So essentially, LVAD for people who are not familiar with, it takes the blood out of left ventricle, so bypass the, essentially bypass the left ventricle, since the ventricle is failing, we use a pump for the blood return to the aortic, ascending aorta most of the time, okay? And, you know, occasionally it will be put placed in a descending aorta or, or sometime near the arch. And this is a relationship between the, the component of the LVAD with the cardiac structure. This is uh, one of the first approved LVAD widely used HARME2. So essentially we can see through every single component except we cannot see through the pump. So this usually a made of metal with high, very high density, titanium usually, and the current energy x-ray is impossible to penetrate to look at the details inside the pump. So not only we can look at the LVAD in two-dimensional view, we can look at a three-dimensional view, and we can add the time here, will be a 4D imaging, and that'll help you get a better uh, feel of what does um, the LVAD in terms of geographic location and relationship with other intracardiac or even upper abdominal uh, structure, okay? So this is the outflow cannula, the pump, the inflow cannula, and this are the drive line that connect to the battery and go outside the patient's body. All right, so a little bit overview. We're gonna look at all the component of the LVAD, inflow conduit, cannula, outflow cannula, and graph. And I'll explain what do I refer by each of them. And one of the major use for cardiac CT is to evaluate the aortic root. And obviously, like any cardiac surgery, for surgical complication. So these are the topogram, MIP, 3D reconstruction of currently, the current type of ELVA you're gonna encounter clinically. So this one we went through already. Uh, this is a HARME-2, widely used up until several years ago, until it was replaced by the HARME-3, and this is currently the only approved LVAD to be implanted. But we do have quite a few patients with HVAD, hardware, HVAD, so we need to get familiar with. Um, so they all share similar uh, uh, structure. They have a pump, they have info cannula to insert it into LV apex, okay? And we have outflow cannula Okay, and then from the alpha cannula is connected to a graph and then go to the ascending aorta. Okay. So usually you can just look at a topogram or x-ray and you can tell exactly what type of elva the patient has. Okay. So what is a normal inflow cannula position? I'm sure Dr. Kasi still had a nightmare when she was a fellow trying to measure this. Um, it was a major issue, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Mawash, uh, with Harmay 2. I think with Harmay 3, it's become less of an issue. Was okay. I think for the last several years, we might have seen one or two uh, camera amount position of Harmay 3, but still we need to pay attention. So essentially, ideally, the long, uh, longitudinal axis of the inflow cannula, you want to be aligned as possible 
as a normal pass of the mitral inflow where the blood would soar around and get into the info camera and then go to the pump. So this will be the ideal position, okay? And this is some example of when the camera is not well placed, you could have complication like suction event or VTAC, like this patient has, very turbulent flow and echo in the inflow camera, like right here, and every time patient move, I think when he, he, will, he, will, he, he stand up, he would have VTAC. Okay, and you can see clearly the camera is essentially embedded into the almost the intraventricular septum. And it's not a surprise the patient uh, would have VTAC every time he changed his position. And some, sometimes uh, because of the angle of the uh, inflow camera, you might not get a very high velocity. Um, but uh, if the clinically, clinically you, know, you suspect a suction, you should have a low threshold of getting a CT. You can see right here. So the inflow cannula, you have this hypodense structure. This is just the cordae. Um, I question, you know, what's the clinical significance of that, although Dr. Bimaraj will assure you this is not benign, but I guess we need to gather more evidence and have more hemodynamic cores, uh, correlation to see if this is uh, warrant, you know, the surgical risk of repositioning the outflow cannula, the inflow cannula. Okay, so this is a patient again presented with uh, intracranial high LDH and intracranial bleeding. Again, and so this again not only limited to RMA2, this is a case with hardware. Hardware also could have. You can see the 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 suction of the. I'm sorry, let's get back. You can see the suction of the myocardium into the tip of the cannula. So how about the outflow cannula or graft position? So as I mentioned, once you come out of the pump, you have this metallic component, and then follow a, a Teflon tube that is uh, encased with a corrugated um, tube that allows you to, because this Teflon tube is very thin, so if you don't have this corrugated tube, uh, you, you it could be bent easily, okay? So this is a good position, obviously, straight up, anastomosis side, no problem, no narrowing. And this, is, uh, this is what we expect most of the time with a little bit of a narrowing at the anastomosis side. And these things in the, forever people had argued this could be clot, but some pathological studies show this is just a chronic oozing of the ser ser uh, serum from the blood in between the Teflon tube, which is invisible by x-ray, and the corrugated tube, okay? Whether this is significant, people always argue, but currently we think it could become a significance and I'll go show you some example later. So again, this is a good position, good alpha camera. Again, this is what we talk about, a little bit narrowing, so this is not, this is just, a, I wouldn't say surgical complication, but uh, this is a way with suture. Um, Other complication with outflow camera could be the component, what we call the bend relief, could be disconnected, although this has been uh, corrected during some recall. You could have bending because this camera was placed with an open chest, so when we close the chest, you cannot predict the extra cardiac structure will be, and sometimes you end up with this. And you could have a patient with uh, infection and with some pseudoaneurysm at an anastomosis site. Again, if you see this almost invariably, this is related to infection. And obviously the most fearful complication, the complete thrombosis of the camera, which fortunately uh, we haven't seen it for years. This is just an example of the patient, unfortunate patient who has 
clot in both infracanula and complete thrombosis of the outflow cannula. As you can see right here, unfortunately, patient didn't make it. Um, this is one more example of what I mentioned earlier. Patient who has harmony 3, good anticoagulation, but does have ischemic event, and I don't know if you can see there's some strain sitting there in the alpha cannula. Again, we don't know the significance of that or actually what's the nature. Is it fibrin? Is it clot? Uh, again, without pathologi pathology correlation, it would be very hard to answer. Okay. So one other major complication that I mentioned earlier was aortic root thrombosis. I'm sorry. Let me, let me take that back. I was looking at the wrong side. So this is uh, what I mentioned to you about this hypotense area surrounding the, in between the lumen of the, the graph and the correlated tube. Okay, so you can see these things can actually progress. And it's not hard to imagine when this becomes excessive and sometimes with a hard, uh, subjected to constant motion and expansion, it could produce some twist or torsion and cause what we call a tamponade physiology, meaning essentially, and that's been shown with a uh, publication where you know, patient had this phenomenon and was treated with percutaneous stent placement. So, it, so if you see those hypotense area, I would say we should you know, follow cl closely and the patient have any low flow alarm, or low threshold to repeat the CT to look at uh, the outflow cannula. So other major complication with the LVAD is aortic root thrombosis. So there we go, patient with clot located in both sinus. And this is, it's not, it could be, it could be dynamic process because the patient was subjected to more aggressive anticoagulation. And uh, I think a year later, for other uh, indication, CT was done. You can see those clot has disappeared, either embolized or resolved. So you can imagine if you have clot in the aortic root, the next complication, it could be, it could happen anywhere. So traditionally, the, the classic teaching is most likely it happens in the non-coronary cusp because there's no coronary there, so there's more stasis. And I think from my own experience, at least it's slightly higher incidence in non-coronary cusp, but could happen in anywhere. And I hope to show you some examples. So this is a case uh, from last year, a patient with harmony 3 as destination therapy, had uh, severe chest pain, troponin elevation, and you can, you know, in retrospect, seeing the echo, there'll be something there. The wall motion abnormality. In CT, you can see the right coronary caps is choked with, with, with clot, and it's extending to the osseum of the RCA. And patient uh, received thrombolytic with slight, you know, some resolution, you can see. Not complete resolution, but some resolution. So, and this is, we have, I, as far as I can recall, we have two cases similar to this. One is the lady with left main thrombosis, and her presentation was obviously more traumatic. Noted this patient has uh, elva place, so they may not present with heart failure simple. They, if they're fully supported, they might not present it, you know, with heart failure symptoms. This would extend. Okay, this is just a recent case we saw, and just give you an idea, the dynamic nature. Okay, you can see the blood roaring here in the non coronary cusp. So if you pay attention in the right coronary cusp, there's also some hypotense material and also, you know, smoke, if you want to say. And you can tell that, for instance, the aortic valve is completely closed. So, you know, we argue all the time, you know, what predisposed the patient to have aortic root thrombosis. 
If you ask me from our experience is between Harmony 2 and Harmony 3, we, again, we don't see, I haven't seen any cannula thrombosis or clotting, but, but aortic root thrombosis, I think, still happens. I don't think it has decreased. Uh, kind of go with the stroke rate of Harmony 3 hasn't really improved. So it's a lot of research to be done, and Norma Wash is working very hard in solving this important issue. Other main uh, reason we get asked to CT all the time is to get a better look at the RV function. You know, the sometimes echo, to say the least, is challenging. And MRI is obviously contraindicated. And CT, the patient, uh, renal function is reasonable. And, you know, if you answer clinical question, uh, we can do RV function assessment. And, uh, and the requirement, obviously, you need to understand that we don't need to use as much contrast for coronary. So even that this case was used, I think we used 40 cc of contrast. Uh, even less, I think. I think 35 cc of contrast, you can get a, you know, in the right patient, right protocol, you can get a very accurate assessment of the RV function, which I think I already went through this in our talk, LV function assessment. You can, we can use attenuation threshold method to calculate the function. So even in this study, which the timing of the bolus is, is not optimal, the AI algorithm works sometimes amazingly well to segment with minimal, minimal intervention. I think in this case, we didn't have to do any changes, manual tracing, and you come out with very nice, I think, accurate assessment of the RV function, ejection fraction, I should say. So pericardial tamponade, needless to say, this is an interesting case. I keep it. The patient with, uh, excuse me, let me go back. You know, patient with buy bad actually, okay? Um, you can see huge tamponade with collapse of the left ventricle and the right ventricle as well. Okay. In this case, I think also is one of the most dramatic cases we've seen. It's a patient with history of endocarditis and infection in the eyes. And I think show up with uh, a, a, a mass in, her, in his sternum and the a regular CT show there's a gigantic cystic-like structure located subesternally and possibly connected to the to the cannula and ascending aorta. You can see right here, and this is the three D reconstruction. So all these things here. Shows show the passage of contrast from the anastomosis to a, essentially a collection of blood, clot, whatever you want to call it. So initially, patient was um, patient has very poor uh, medical uh, subs, uh, substrate, and uh, the decision was wait and see, and I think six months later he show up with uh, chest pain and the mass essentially extended even bigger to the point that the, the fear was it would rupture and actually patient went through the surgery. I think he survived. So, and I, I, should, I, I promise the next time I'll show you the, the CT, you can see the alpha cannula actually swinging around, you know, essentially detached and floating in the pool of blood. Uh, so, and last, uh, you know, we ne definitely need to have uh, my watch come here next time because we're doing more and more. We're doing PET here and for suspected infection. Uh, so this is the FGD, FDG uptake of the patient that I show you. It's a bright, bright uptake. So it was confirmed. A patient was obviously already on chronic antibiotic, but still, uh, with all the uh, damage done already, uh, uh, the suture couldn't hold. And LT regurgitation, I think that's Dr. You know, Mawash is really interested in this, and 
and we can assess anatomical area and and study aortic re uh, regurgitation or lack of co-optation, I should say, and uh, we should probably should study this more systematically. So how do we scan the patient? Obviously, ECG gated is critical. I mean, you can see the outflow camera, inflow camera are okay without gated because they don't move as much, but if you want to see very well the aortic root and the coronary, you need gated. Depending on the patient's age, uh, if the patient has destination therapy or older, you know, we do retrospective gating, and the dosage is not, uh, not ideal because we're giving significant radiation, but given their uh, overall prognosis and, and the seriousness of the condition, I think it's, it's worth it. The contrast could range from four to five cc per second and go from 40 to 100 cc, um, and we, we had a, a small study done when we start doing LVAD, the risk in patients with GFR more than 45, the risk of acute renal failure is very low. And obviously we would like to update our database. So overall, uh, the CTA indication, when you have an LVAD patient and have a thromboembody event, I think it's a must to get a CT to evaluate the LT route. In for camera alpha grad, it's less likely was one thing that's very interesting that I will, with some of my EP colleagues are here for over 200, 300 CTA we've seen, I never seen any clot in the left atrial appendage, not even smoke. Well, I could have about one patient that smoke, but that's it. It's, it's quite intriguing. Maybe the process of sucking the blood, LVAD improves the circulation and less stasis in the left atrial appendage. So that's something that I thought was interesting and troubleshooting low flow alarm obviously suction event or kinking obstruction or twisting of the alpha cannula or patient with persistent heart failure you want to look at if there's any localized tamponade rv failure or the echo is suboptimal or maybe uh, the aortic valve lack of co-optation and position b versus related v tag once in a while we've done it and for infection obviously PET and CT. So the first guideline for multimodality imaging was published by American Society of ECHO, and thanks to the support of Dr. Little and Dr. Estep. So this was done in 2015, and we just finished uh, collaborating to have the new guideline, who hopefully will come out this year. And uh, so not only CT, but we'll talk about PET, ECHO, and it will be a comprehensive a document not only with a permanent assist divide, but also for temporary support as well. Okay, that's all I have, and I'm willing to uh, take any question. Mm -hmm. nope. I'm watching what, uh, what Dr. Kashi set up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think my watch is probably more suit ready to answer that question. My personal take is we try to do some study. But I think the key here is, is true that is difficult until they close the chest. But I think one thing we haven't done is systematically do the CTA we used to do in the beginning, non-contract CT before surgery, because that's all you really need, okay? For, right. To see if there's any predictor of patient coming up of the OR with malposition. But I think fortunately, what we've seen is with, that is used to be a more problem with the intraperitoneal device like Harmony 3, Harmony 2. With Harmony 3, again, it's become, because the camera is, the pump is almost directly embedded into the left ventricle. So 
unless you have a very, very small ventricle, you usually don't see malposition as a problem. If you see it because there's some suction of the core, which I don't think you can prevent that. Yeah. Um, I think I'll answer that question towards the end, if that's okay, Dr. Q, uh, because I want to take you through the yeah. whirlwind of my slides. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a very important question, and I don't think we've uh, reached a conclusion to it. But what I really wanted to do this year is um, I've been giving this talk for the last four years, and even I got bored of my own talk. So I made a completely new talk, and this is kind of directed at imagers from a heart failure cardiologist. I'm not an imager, but I'm interested in imaging. Um, so. Uh, we all know that LVAD is a useful alternative to transplant. It continues to be an effective uh, way to bridge transplant uh, patients and um, also used as destination therapy and wide uh, uh, array of patients are on destination therapy in the United States. We have had increased yearly implants and uh, we've had great outcomes, long and short uh, uh, term outcomes and particularly with the new Momentum 3 trial, the five year outcomes are excellent. So we're looking at uh, uh, longer survival really reduction in hemocompatibility-related adverse events, particularly pump thrombosis that used to be a big alarming situation for us in the past. And what I use, I'll tell you what I use imaging for and then um, to kind of help the sonographers, the imagers, the fellow in the audience to understand what I really am asking for and why am I asking for that. Um, truly, there's complementary role of cardiac catheterization, um, uh, derived hemodynamics, echocardiography, cardiac CT, and PET, and we use all of these imaging um, but I, I want to just make sure I, I do get this to the audience that I don't use echo without hemodynamics, and I don't use echo without CT to kind of understand, and I, there's a definite complementary role of, um, uh, of PET. So we went from HeartMate 2 to HeartWare to HeartMate 3, and right now HeartMate 2 and HVAT are obsolete, and the only device we have is HeartMate 3. So most of my um, kind of talk will be geared around HeartMate 3, what was disappointing in the most recent literature review for me is that not a lot was published in the last two years on imaging of heart made three devices and really trying to bridge those gaps in our understanding, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Important device components, so we know the inflow cannula, there's an impeller, uh, this is the axial flow device, and then there's the outflow cannula. Um, this is the, the historic heart made two device. There's a percutaneous lead that sticks out of your body, and there's an external power source, and then there's a system controller. So that's about the device. Then the HeartWare and HeartMate 3. Um, there are still patients on support, so that's why I'm going over this. Um, this, uh, basically, the inflow can and the impeller sticks on the pericardium. It, it, it does cause some degree of pericardial constraint, which is kind of unexplored how, how much that affects the whole LVRV um, interaction and interdependence. Why is, what is the difference between the axial and the centrifugal flow pump? It basically is direction of flow. In the axial flow pump, the flow just directly goes in parallel to the, to the bearings, and that's basically um, parallel direction. And, and in a centrifugal flow pump, uh, the pump is perpendicular flow, so blood moves in, then it is propelled through a centrifugal flow pump action, and that's perpendicular flow. Features unique to HeartMate 3, again, like this is the device that we're going to use in the next couple of years, that it has magnetic levitation, it has wide blood flow path, so there's less shear stress in which we see that there is less GI bleeding, there is less hemocompatibility related adverse events due to this feature. There is titanium microspheres, uh, which basically senator all uh, the blood contacting surfaces, and it, it additionally has this internal pulsatility function at um, basically 30 beats per minute, which creates acute um, Doppler waveform um, as an extra uh, sort of like a washout. Um, why do we need imaging? So we need imaging to understand, number one, is the pump functioning or not? Number two, really, is the pump uh, uh, causing effective unloading or not? How is it affecting my RV function? Are there any uh, valvular abnormalities, including AR, MR, and TR? And then complications, honestly, pump thrombosis has become obsolete. Again, like I said, heart made two people are still on supports. So we may see here and there, but it is an obsolete situation with heart made three. Very rarely does it occur. Root thrombosis, as Dr. Uh, Chang mentioned, is still there. Then troubleshooting alarms is uh, one situation where we order echoes and CTs. And really, uh, one other very important situation where we do um, you know, all sorts of imaging, including cardiopulmonary exercise testing, is where patients have had recovery, and we're trying to figure out if we can decommission their LVAD, which we have done in the last year. We have de decommissioned two LVADs on patients who had non-ischemic hermopathy. 
Then one thing that sticks outside the box is risk assessment. And this is where we are really interested in trying to figure out which of our patients at, are at higher risk of having strokes and other hemocompatibility related adverse, an area that I'm um, very interested in and um, hopefully we'll make some develops there, developments there. There's definitely ongoing research to improve the device design. And there is a race to develop a fully implantable NPLAD, uh, which will hopefully happen in the next couple of years. Now, important physiological concepts is what is important in an LVAT. The, the, the pressure differential concept is very important. That's important for, for fellows and imagers and people taking care of LVAT. So basically, you have two pressure differential. One pressure differential is what is between inflow cannula and the outflow graft. And the other pressure differential is what is between the LV and aorta. These two basically have the propensity to sort of uh, compete with each other in a sense. When you have a higher inflow cannula flow, this um, creates kind of a higher pressure differential in, in towards this side, more blood flow, whereas uh, this would take away from the flow through the aorta. And that's what we are looking for, and that is what is important for us. One important thing to remember is that the pumps are super sensitive to afterload. They are three to four times more sensitive to increase in afterload um, than just normal uh, you know, human beings. And um, the HeartMate 3 has this effect where um, if you look at the pressure differential waveform, it is more curved. So the overall flow in systole and diastole is, is sort of maintained and it, it is less sensitive to the afterload effect. So that's also an important development sort of in device technology where it is less afterload sensitive as opposed to the older HeartMe2 device. And so this is just a graph showing that, that this graph is sort of curved. The pressure differential does not experience as many changes as it is used to with afterload changes. So because blood pressure is a very important uh, component of what we do. The pumps are sensitive to preload, but not as much. Uh, sometimes we are surprised at looking at um, an LVAT patient walking around with the hemoglobin, and trust me, this is true, of three without having significant issues, and you wonder why that happens. It's because the pumps are not as preload sensitive. Yes, you see alarms, but it, they're still able to maintain an output, surprisingly enough. This is just uh, looking at how the technology has changed, combining preload and afterload impact on cardiac output. And if you look at the axial flow pumps, they were very sensitive to preload and afterload, but that's kind of changed. And, and it only in extreme situations does the centrifugal flow pump get affected by preload and afterload. So what happens with uh, when we put in LVAD? What is the effect on LV? We're going to talk about that first. So basically, LVAD um, you know, uh, decreases the LV size. This effect is sort of immediate. And this continues to occur over weeks to months where you see that somebody who got implanted right after the surgery, the LV diameter was like nine centimeter, reduced to 8.5, eight, and then after a couple of months, you saw them, their LV size decreases even more. And um, you also see a decrease in LV and diastolic pressure, which is the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. When we do the RAM studies in the cath lab, we see that the pressures decrease right away within two minutes of us increasing the pump speed. And this process of increasing the pump speed is what we call a ramp study, a ramp up or a ramp down, where you increase the, the, the speed and look at the changes on echocardiogram and on cath. There is reduction in myocyte size and increase in relative collagen um, deposition. And we see that there is increase in circa 2 activation, which actually helps with myocardial recovery. And this improvement, the total improvement in PV loop relationship occurs over greater than 40 days. So basically, why we're asking for echo right after, why we're asking for echo when we increase the speed, and why are we asking for an echo when we see them in clinic is because of these reasons. And you will see that there is decrement in LV and diastolic pressure. There is improvement in sort of overall hemodynamics. Again, I, like I said, full disclosure, we do not use echocardiography alone. We need to know what the hemodynamics are in conjunction with echocardiography. And this is sort of what we're looking at. We're looking at LV and diastolic dimension. I'm looking at the RV function. Believe it or not, this is a good RV function for us. Um, the RV is moving. Um, but um, aortic valve also, if it's you know, closed or open, and why is that important? So effect on aortic valve. This is where it gets important. Why is it important? One, it's important for us for management of blood pressure. So if you even, I mean, I, I sometimes recognize that uh, images are perfectionists and 
can see sometimes but not fully. For us, it is very important to know if you see the aortic valve open or not, even if it's intermittently opening, because it does change our management. <laughs> our blood pressure is different when you have aortic valve opening versus not. When it doesn't open, your blood pressure that we get from Doppler is your mean arterial pressure. And when it does open, that, that Doppler blood pressure is your systolic blood pressure. So super important. So if it's on the report, it does help me. And I don't have to go and open the report. Then we'll talk about LV unloading in a little bit uh, detail. But one of the markers of LV unloading, LV unloading is not just aortic valve is closed. And so that's it. We are unloaded appropriately. Not true. So it is a combination of different criteria that we look at, but one of which is aortic valve opening. And then the third thing that I really want to know, you know, a lot of patients, um, uh, does anybody know what is the number one uh, reason why patients die after LVAD according to the most recent um, uh, ISHLT statement? Is basically withdrawal of care. Um, so basically, when you have somebody who's highly dependent on the LVAD versus not, you kind of, it's important to make those decisions. So it's important for me to understand if a patient is completely dependent on their LVAD or not, and patients who have complete aortic valve closures usually are. It kind of gets me a sense. Um, so this is where I was talking about what happens to arterial blood pressure and pulsatility. So as you increase the pulse, um, uh, the pump flow, the mean blood pressure increases. The systolic blood pressure actually decreases or remains the same. The diastolic blood pressure increases. So you see on Doppler, you see both systolic flow and diastolic flow in the inflow canal, and I'll have a showing image of that. And overall, the pulse pressure decreases. This is what happens with incremental speed. So what it is is that heart and LVAD interaction, there are four important components of what determines how the LVAD works and how effectively it unloads the patient. It's the, it's the preload, it's the afterload, it's the LV contractility, and then it's the pump speed. All of that is very important. The general recommendations from ISHLT is to uh, is, uh, Doppler blood pressure less than 80 millimeters of mercury. This is the same exact thing, but in a more graphical kind of way. If you increase the LVAD pump speed, what it does is it, it reduces the LV stroke uh, volume, and this reduces the LV uh, aortic uh, sorry pressure, and the pulse pressure reduces. The, the waveform becomes more kind of um, straight when we look at it in, um, uh, in the cath lab with, uh, with an arterial line. And, and this is the effect of, um, of increasing the pump, um, basically, speed. And the opposite occurs when you have um, uh, sort of, if you decrease the speed, what will happen is the pulse pressure will increase. And so you will have more output from the LV in itself. In, in some ways, when we're trying to figure out if somebody is really recovered or not, we try to turn their pump speed down and see what happens to their LV. If they're still contracting and squeezing well, that means that they're not as dependent, and truly this is recovery, and this is not just the, the impact of unloading, because some people really shrink their LV size, and the EF looks better than what it really is. So we have to be careful of making those extrapolations. This is what looks like uh, the PV um, loop looks like. As you increase the LVAD flow, this was a question on my cardiology boards. So again, uh, Doppler assessment of inflow canal, as I mentioned, as you increase the pump speed, you see that it becomes, there's flow through diastole as well as systole. Um, I will uh, make sure to give you this caution statement. Um, usually, these are not accurate. Usually, they're not well aligned. Do not extrapolate. Unfortunately, with, with how our anatomy is, we've not developed a good way of really getting aligned with the inflow cannula properly. And this is not something that me and Dr. Yusuf Zai talk about in terms of patients. Oh, the velocity was higher, so we need to do something about it. Really, we really don't pay much attention to the inflow cannula velocity because we don't trust it. Um, this is just like um, uh, an assessment of what cardiac output looks like. You can make an assessment of cardiac output using echocardiography, but again, we don't trust it because what you really need to do is um, RVOT TVI through the, through the R, uh, RVOT TVI and, and use that for cardiac output, and we know that that's usually not accurate. But in the cath lab, what we are trying to see is how much native contribution is from the aorta and how much native contribution is from the LVAD, and that's their total cardiac output. And we use thermodilution and fake cardiac output to determine that. If the aortic valve opens again, then the, the card total cardiac output in the systemic flow is a combination of LVAD plus aortic flow. And if there is no flow through the aortic valve, then, then cardiac output is solely determined by our, um, the um, LVAD flow. Now, what, is, what tells us whether the LV is appropriately unloaded and what is the optimal LVAD speed? Um, typical features that are consistent with inadequate unloading when LVAD is when you have a dilated left ventricle and dilated left atrial enlargement. But it's very important to know who your patient was from the get-go, the baseline. If somebody's LV is like 10 centimeters, for them, if they achieved 5 centimeters, that's 
really impressive. But you know, we cannot just give an absolute value to it and just say that, oh, the LV looks dilated, so they're not effectively unloaded. You have to compare to what their baseline was. If they have persistent secondary mitral regurgitation, um, that is also a sign that they're not appropriately unloaded. If their systolic PA pressure is greater than 40 millimeters um, and they have an elevated RA pressure, that they could also be not unloaded. But the caveat here being that the RV behaves on its own in LVAT patients, and we have to pay attention to RV parameters and right atrial pressure. If they, they have very high right atrial pressure, that could mean that they have an impaired right ventricle. And then the mitral EA and Doppler velocity greater than two, that was done by Dr. Naga. I have some slides about that. Then um, the optimal speed is thought to be one where your aortic valve is closed or it intermittently opens. The interventricular septum is midline, where it is not affecting the LVRV interdependence. The mitral and aortic regurgitation is minimized, and the wedge pressure is less than 18. Um, this was done uh, by Dr. Naga and Dr. Estep, um, kind of looking at diastology and, and filling pressures from uh, echo and doing uh, hemodynamic corroborates. This is an area where uh, we could do better because we actually do not have any data on HeartMate 3. Um, we only have data on HeartMate 2, and we're using that data for years, and that's certainly an area that we can work on together. Um, this is similar to what we use for diastology, but just there's a few different changes, but this is uh, what we use for LVAD, um, and we've been using this for years. Um, I talked about the RAM study. I know sonographers really enjoy this, but uh, <laughs> and so do the readers, but it <laughs> gives us very important information. Um, I really thank you all for doing this with us and uh, you know being exposed to radiation in the cath lab as well. But what we're trying to really do is that with each incremental speed, look at the LV and diastolic dimension, the systolic dimension, the AV opening, the septum, whether it's midline or not, the AR, MR, TR, TAPC, RV systolic pressure, and IVC. We actually do not, uh, we're not very good about assessing maybe RV, which we could probably do better, and that's an area of, um, that needs more attention. Now, one thing I wanted to mention here is that not everybody's ventricle behaves the same. And why is that? Um, very important question, and I'll talk about what that really means. And not everybody's, um, so generally speaking, if you're effectively unloaded, right ventricle behaves uh, in a funny way, and a lot of times it will get better and the right ventricle parameters get better because the RV afterload decreases. But in some patients, the RV actually gets worse, and you really have to identify who those patients are. Um, the whole phenomena of trying to make, keep the septum midline is also important for that reason. So uh, before we move on to some of the other factors, I just want to make sure that I, I get this message across that if you or patient is not effectively unloaded, you are not doing them a favor. They may look okay. You may have some sort of um, reluctance to increase their pump speed, but if they're not effectively unloaded and they have not met all those criteria that I mentioned earlier, they are going to have poor outcomes. And that was shown in this study, which is the Ramp It Up study, where they actually also had um, hemocompatibility related advance, more GI bleeds, um, and I think that has to do with, uh, you know, sort of RV dysfunction, ineffective unloading, and congestion of the liver, which leads to more uh, GI bleeds, sort of. Now, when I talked about why not uh, everybody's LV behaves the same, it's because of the inflow cannula. So in this uh, particular echo, you can see that the inflow cannula is all collapsed around the LV and at a very low speed. This is 4,800 RPMs is nothing for us. Um, but um, some people require you know, higher speed, and some people don't do well with even the higher speeds. And, and the, the role of inflow cannula is very important, which is why what Dr. Chang does for us is very important. So you could have somebody who has like a humongous cavity, and no matter which direction the inflow is in, it is still doing what it's supposed to do, uh, but it's not interacting with the walls. But there are some unfortunate patients where like the inflow cannula, as soon as the chest closes, the inflow cannula direction completely changes, and that was what Dr. Q was asking. We just don't have a way to you know, determine that because everything changes and falls apart once the chest closes, and, and their position is very hard to change. We usually don't have a way to go back to do that, and if that happens, they remain ineffectively unloaded for, for the rest of the duration. Um, and then we try to mitigate that situation by using medication. So guideline-directed medical therapy, diuretics, are still things that we use in these patients. Um, one important thing that I want to mention is that, <laughs> so uh, suck down is a real thing, you know, and it does happen, you know, and I've seen it. Um, this is a patient who uh, was new implant, and this is the, the small little um, slither is actually the LV, and it completely collapsed on itself with the RV just, uh, you know, subtle shift. The RV became humongous, and this happens usually either very early on in the early uh, phase when patients have RV failure, 
Uh, if they have a small cavity, if they have an off-axis cannula, if they have low preload, the low preload can be because if they're hypovolemic, but also more importantly, could also be because they have RV failure. And if they're uh, right after surgery and they have RV failure and they have low output and then you increase the pump speed, you're really asking for trouble. Um, fortunately, we, we decrease the pump speed, the suck down gets better, and the LVAD in itself has a mechanism where it will relieve the suction by decreasing pump speed by itself. So, and the newer pump, HeartMate 3, actually has less suck down events because it has that intrinsic mechanism. Um, uh, and so sometimes it also starts happening more when you have patients who have LV recovery. So if you have patients who have a lot of suck down events, you may want to look at their LV function, make sure they're not having improvement in their RV function. Um, what are some of the differential diagnoses of ineffective unloading is when you have the, the pump speed is set low, if they, they have excessive afterload, which is what I talked about earlier, if they have outflow kinking, um, which, where CT helps. Echo, unfortunately, doesn't give us a view of the outflow cannula. Um, and if they have inflow cannula malposition, if they have something with the, wrong with the pump and its func malfunctions, which used to happen a lot with the older devices, not so much with the newer ones. And then if you have an um, a, a, a acquired continuous aortic regurgitation, and that does still happen, and that's still relevant to HeartMate 3, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Here, this uh, big Goomba is actually a fungus. Um, it's candida. And uh, this is a patient who went through a full exchange uh, because of that reason, because the pump was infected. Talking about aortic regurgitation, still relevant, still important. Around 25 to 50% of patients develop aortic regurgitation in the first year. What that really creates is basically a short circuit. It short circuits and keeps leaking blood into the ventricle, and so you have ineffective unloading. And how do we diagnose it and go about it? Echo, um, and sorry, Dr. Zogby is not helpful, <laughs> uh, but uh, but um, you know it. Uh, <laughs> Unfortunately not. Um, so the problem with echo is twofold. So we don't really have a gold standard to really quantify aortic regurgitation volume against. Um, I worked with Dr. Little in the last year, and we created a mock flow loop, and that publication will be uh, soon in the next couple of weeks. And we determined that basically all your traditional echo parameters um, fell apart. So none of them made sense, and they did not correlate with aortic regurgitation. Rather, aortic regurgitation looked a lot worse than it actually was. Um, and as you increase the pump speed, the echo, the AR jet started looking even worse. And but but the the total uh, net AR volume change was only 10 ml. So, so that was a little bit eye opening. But it's just you know not uh, not data that you know it's not not a human. It's mock flow loop. So it gives us some idea, but we still don't know. What we really discriminate patients in is like if they have mild AR or versus severe AR, basically extremes you can tell, and then you have to corroborate that with your hemodynamic studies. If they have high filling pressures and they're coming in with the current heart failure admissions to the hospital and they have like a rip roaring big, um, uh, you know, sort of aortic regurgitation hole. This uh, process basically happens with commissural fusion. So what you form is a central aortic jet in most cases, unless you have infective endocarditis, and then you can have multiple holes. Um, I do use CT for this purpose. You know, a lot of our patients who we are contemplating whether we should do something extensive to them and you know consider them for a TAVR or a full transplant, we do recommend doing CT scan to understand their aortic regurgitation better. And that's something that we're going to work on with Dr. Chang um, in the near future. Um, it's still a problem with HeartMate 3, um, and, and if you have AR, you, you, you don't do well, is what we know. Um, and there is a study which looked at some novel, novel parameters. What they did was they looked at the outflow cannula, and they looked at the systolic-diastolic ratio, and they looked at the diastolic acceleration, and they uh, used um, hemodynamic plus echo data combined to generate an uh, aortic valve regurgitation fraction. And, and corroborated these findings um, with, uh, with the systolic-diastolic um, uh, velocity ratio as well as the diastolic acceleration. The problem with that is that I have a very hard time believing the echo data uh, because they're using RVOTTVI. Again, the same problem. If you don't measure it properly, you're probably underestimating or overestimating. But in patients where we do have the outflow cannula, I'd strongly recommend do get these parameters so we can at least systematically look at them in our patient population too. The uh, Niriru and his group had done this study, and they looked at longitudinal follow-up on patients and did determine that uh, the, it was associated with poorer outcomes in patients. Uh, this is a sort of a chart uh, showing what they're really looking at. So with um, severe aortic regurgitation, the diastolic acceleration does increase 68.7, and the uh, S to D ratio decreases, uh, so it's 2.6. Um, 
but again, you know, there's there's some issues with with using this. Quick question: Is with PP you are doing a Uzbekistan bulb area? Yeah. Why couldn't we do something similar with a PPP for access of the electric car? We can certainly use that too. Yeah. I think so, especially with the newer like technology, I, I feel like we've made so much more advancements that that's certainly a possibility. But as a as a center, like systematically, I mean, this is an area we could really like work on and look into, and we haven't done that, and we should. I think that's important because this is still a very relevant problem. Um, and um, so this one caveat, based on their studies, a traditional visual assessment um, uh, underestimated, but you know our study, which I mentioned, did overestimate um, AR severity. Moving on to the next animal uh, is the effect on right ventricle. Unfortunately, right ventricle keeps us on our toes and is really hard to determine who's going to develop RV failure, what is happening to them. There is early and late RV failure, and we just don't rely on echo. The reason being that the echo with two patients, with one with very poor hemodynamics and one with very good hemodynamics, if you look at their echo images, they may look exactly the same and which is where we are at a loss. We don't understand which echo parameters can we use to determine which are the ones that have very bad RV failure. People that we're following as outpatient, like late RV failure, we just don't know what to do with them and how to determine that. And we heavily rely on hemodynamics. That's the honest truth. Um, and uh, basically what, what an LVAD does to an RV is that once the LVAD unloads the left ventricle, it basically decreases the pulmonary pressures and the RV afterload decreases. So there is a one third of the patients where the RV likes it, gets better. One third, which nothing happens, their RV is the same, nothing changes, but one third, which they get worse. And that has to do with several other factors too. Remember the cardiomyopathy reasons are different. Some people have genetic cardiomyopathy, some people have ischemic cardiomyopathy. It usually depends on how much damage was already done or is progressing on towards the right ventricle. So the heart's still there. The, the, and then the one a very important aspect of all of this is the RV LV septal interaction. Almost behaves like constriction. If you, if you ask my opinion about it, we see the septal bounds, and we see this interaction become very profound in certain patients. In other patients, it's not as profound, and we don't understand the reasons behind it. So when we're looking at RAM studies, we make sure that when you're, uh, again, very thankful to everyone who comes and does these RAM studies with us, um, if the RV, then there's a septal shift, then we stop. We don't increase the pump speed anymore. We try to leave it like sort of where it's midline. Um, we also look at the central venous pressure um, and a sort of IVC on echocardiogram to make sure that you know we're not increasing the central venous pressure. And, and you know there's there's we that data we know right away, but there are certain patients that may develop progressive RV failure because the septal is completely uh, sort of shifted towards the left. Um, so um, early and delayed RV failure. I just made up things here, I don't think we know what helps us. Um, RV function, TAPSI, fractional area change, there's uh, you know, data on it, but none so convincing and none that we use in clinical practice to really determine RV function. A um, Little bit switching gears, just going on what we see on the console, a lot of you guys see patients, and, and so we, what we really are seeing is pump flow, the pump speed, and then the pulsatility index, and what, what is pulsatility index? So what is the only direct measurement that you get from the LVAT console is the power. Everything else is extrapolated. Simple as that. Flow is derived from power, and the pulsatility uh, in the flow is uh, basically what we call the pulsatility index. This is what we, if you, if you think back about what I talked about earlier about the whole pressure differential, this is an index of that. How much pressure differential occurs with each sort of cycle, and this gives us an average of that. For example, if somebody has LV recovery and they have a very contractile left ventricle, their pulsatility index is going to be high. Okay. If somebody has high blood pressure, because there's such high afterload and there is dynamic changes, you will see that the pulsatility index will again increase. So it is upon the clinician to understand why each of these hap things happen and not just you know rely on the console in itself. Um, and, and so, so sh shifting gears to some other important complications, and how can imaging help me? Um, pump thrombosis is not as relevant anymore, but like I said, heart may too still exists, and we talk about it, and I'll give some slides about that. GI bleeding, not so helpful. Um, stroke, I've, I'm working with CTs and Dr. Chang in trying to figure out if we can use these to predict 
those who will develop strokes. Because for example, if some young patient who has a very harsh uh, cannula angle on the outflow and they are in their bridge to transplant, we want to transplant them sooner, right? So that's, it will help us with risk prediction. Infection, we have seen some very gruesome um, uh, images from Dr. Chang and infections are real. And again, these patients will not look septic. They have this amazing reserve. And, and you know, I, I when they start um, sort of decompensating from sepsis is when the sepsis is overwhelming. Now the cytokines have gone to the extreme, and then you see it, really. Um, other things, imaging, of course, like recurrent heart failure admissions, and as, as I mentioned earlier, uh, early and delayed RV failure. But big area of research, in my mind, and it is an area that I'm really interested in, is risk prediction. Once you have the LVAD, we do a lot of risk predictive scores before LVAD, and we look at their baseline, but we lack in understanding in risk prediction um, going forward. One other like sort of area that I'm interested in is like smaller LV cavity and interactions of that, and women generally have smaller LV cavities, and we see that their outcomes are not as great. Um, this is just an image showing what happens if you have pump thrombosis. This was also something that Dr. Naga and Dr. Eastep had worked on historically. If in a normal uh, heart pump, uh, the LV size should decrease with increasing speed, the AV opening decreases, and the mitral deceleration time increases. Um, whereas if you develop pump thrombosis, the LV size doesn't change, the AV opening remains open, and mitral deceleration time does not change. So that kind of tells you if the pump is not functioning okay. PET uh, is another sort of, we're ordering a lot of PET now for it to really quantify or understand the extent of the infections. We've seen infections, the outflow, inflow, all over the device. And we actually are one of the few centers that do full exchanges for our patients, which means the whole device can be extracted and re-changed, uh, particularly people who are on destination therapy. Now, re remember, patients are living on LVATs for more than five years now. And if what is the end goal? So the end goal could be a full exchange if the infection is severe. One word of caution, and this is a sort of worrisome, is that the degree of um, sort of resistance we create with these infections is very worrisome and alarming. And one of our goals is to kind of develop modern technology to reduce these in, in very uh, resistant organisms. And we're working with our ID department to work on something called phage therapy that would help us you know, infiltrate the layer of bacteria that basically forms on these devices. Um, lastly, like. Uh, when we are looking at complications, one of the things is to really understand what the alarms are from, and that's when we also order echoes. Um, so this is somebody who had l sort of low flow and had pericardial effusion. One thing I wanted to mention is that uh, for LVAT patient, it doesn't really take a lot of pericardial effusion to actually cause tamponade. And we see when we, they take into the OR, very minimal fluid, and if you extract it, you know, their, their pump flow improves. Because again, th this, this has to do uh, with something with the LV RV interdependence, so 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 it's a little bit more complicated, but important to remember. And these are some of the other scenarios. I don't think I'm going to go over them in detail, but generally speaking, if you have low flow, you know, think about RV failure, think about hypovolemia. If you have hypertension, can also cause low flow. Um, if you have high flows, that's usually vasodilatory state, um, usually from uh, sepsis, or if you use too many vasodilators. And again, if you have high PI, think about LV recovery too. Um, I think, so So that's where um, assessment of myocardial recovery is important. And we're actually using CT also to help us. And then we do cardiopulmonary exercise test in these patients to see if they're real reserve. And we make them exercise with um, echo um, and heart cath uh, combined. Now, switching gears to what is new, I, again, as I mentioned, I was disappointed in, in, in how much literature there is out there on LVAD in the last at least two years, not much. Um, but there are some new technologies some people have used. This is echocardiographic PIV, where they looked at um, the vortices that form with LVADs. Um, and these are some of the vortex parameters in all uh, 17 patients that they looked at. Um, the vortex formation that, um, was very low. Um, this is something probably we can use for RV assessment, and this is a technique that is now, uh, you know, can be used and is available to us. One other important thing is echo contrast is safe, and we can, we can safely use this, and PIV actually uses echo contrast to determine this. This I thought was very cool. It was the, it's vector flow mapping technology that they did at the time of the surgery, and basically used an epiaotic echocardiogram. And, and, and looked at all the uh, uh, different waveforms and, 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 um, and uh, uh, flow mapping that occurred with, uh, with, uh, with the implantation of the outflow graph. Um, this was surprising. <laughs> so like we're, they're looking at PET 
to determine myocardial uh, blood flow reserve in LVAD patients, and there's a couple of uh, sort of uh, yeah, um, publications on that, um, uh, and they've looked at patients with low speed, high speed, and changes. Um, so that's something that, you know, we already do PET for infection and whether, whether, whether we could do this for, for patients who were thinking about decommissioning. So future directions, I mean, I think we really need to validate diastology in HeartMate 3. Um, we need to come up with uh, novel Im imaging tools to really understand LVRV interplay um, and corroborate the echocardiography and in he invasive hem hemodynamics once again in HeartMate 3 population and really assess uh, for risk uh, recovery, uh, risk assessment and then recovery um, and try to understand who are at risk of strokes and other complications. So with that, I will close. <laughs> Any questions? About the package. Mm -hmm. So we we bring these patients for RAM studies one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for one reason or another, we we bring them into the cath lab frequently. Um, is there any way? I was wondering to use fluoroscopy to um, look at the outflow cannula angle or determine the malposition. I know we use CT and other modalities, but have, has anybody looked at fluoroscopy angles to kind of look at cannula position, inflow and outflow? So, um, you know, so just um, if you're talking about fluoroscopy, I think about chest x-ray because it's kind of like, or you know, if, yeah. Right. So that, you know, x-ray angles were studied and they were not helpful. And mm -hmm. fluoroscopy also was studied was not helpful. In the cath lab, one thing that you can do and which I didn't talk about today because I had a lot to talk about is ice. Um, so when I was at Mayo, we did like a study on intracardiac echocardiography and you get beautiful images of the outflow graft. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we can use and that would, you know, eliminate the need to actually have um, echo as well. Uh, we just have to, you know, sort of create that protocol and, and, and you know, because it is still an invasive procedure, but it's very safe, as we all know, so we can certainly do that. Oops. <laughs> that was beautiful, really nice. Uh, question to you, one, wh what do you mean by <clears throat> septum in the midline? I don't know what the midline is. So um, what it, you know, uh, so, so, Physiologically, what it really is that when the septum deviates too much towards the left, and we don't know what that too much is. So if you're asking me what that is, I don't know. But what it causes is it really affects the RV stroke work index, and it causes over time um, RV septal wall thinning, and it overall sort of affects the RV um, cardiac output, stroke volume, and makes negative changes over time. No, I understand that. The, mm -hmm. the, the question is for us to speak the same language. Mm -hmm. So either you guys, meaning in the heart failure world, and get together with the imagers and decide what's the midline. And conceivably, it could be actually a short axis looking at the, at the curvature of the left ventricle and see if the septum is really being pushed towards the LV as opposed to, because midline is, RV can be very big, LV can be very big. Mm -hmm. And you have to decide as to what is helpful for you and, and correlate it with the dynamics. The other question I have for you is, I know you mentioned something about the RV, but if you tell me what is probably the best index currently for RV function is strain, free wall strain. Not the whole ventricle, but free wall strain because the septum is influenced by so many other things. So. The problem is imaging it well. And I know in the lab, more difficult to image the RV. And it is problematic. Last point I have for you is, I cannot say that for sure, but I think you and I and us have to get together regarding aortic regurgitation because the difference of aortic regurg here is a continuous aortic regurgitation. The question is, how do you define severity when you have continuous aortic regurgitation? And although you may see it on color Doppler, the information that is very important also is in the CW. If you take a look at the CW, if you have continuous AR, you have basically the changes in pressure between the two chambers that may not cross, and that's why you don't have forward flow. And so if you have a pressure change that is so significant, the volume 
although you look at color Doppler, it looks about the same, the volume of regurgitation, so you may want to integrate these two together to come up because most of them are central. And if it is central most of the time, actually it's the easiest one to, you know, I know you're gravitating towards CT, I have nothing <laughs> against CT, <laughs> but, but you need more than the just size of the hole mm -hmm. to help you identify the significance of regurgitation. No, I, I completely agree. I, I didn't mean to <laughs> say. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> First, this is the best talk I've heard on this topic. So, congrats. Um, we like the fact that you changed it. <laughs> 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 so, you know, we have this middle of the night or afternoon or 6 o'clock p.m. stat echoes on an LVAD. Portable. Most of the time, image is not that great quality. Help us here. Of all this stuff that you taught, taught us today, what one or two indices that you want from that stat echo? Because most of the time we cannot provide all the information that we would normally want because for all the reasons. They, then they use contrast and then with the contrast you can get LV dimensions but then it's harder to see the aortic valve. So what or everything in that middle of the night stat emergency echo is it that you're looking for? So uh, 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 we are now, as a practice, really shying away from doing stat echoes and you know on LVAT patients because we usually have hemodynamic data. So when we order a stat echo, it's usually we're trying to see the inflow cannula position if we have increased the speed uh, a couple of hours ago and it may have caused a suck down. That's one of the things that I'm looking for. The other one is if patients develop severe RV failure, you know, we have hemodynamic data, but we want to corroborate the hemodynamic data with the echo as well, looking at the LV, RV sort of uh, uh, dimensions and the inter interventricular septum. That's when we order it. And the third one is really pericardial effusion. Short of that, I mean, I, I'll be honest, um, it's more clinical assessment. It's um, trying to really understand what the patient has. And you're right, with, we could use portable echoes, and then we're trying to create a study with Dr. Chabrulo where we're gonna look at my portable echoes and, and utility of that and just navigating through because it, it is a cost expense. I mean, imagine a lot of patients get admitted so many times, so we don't wanna just suck every single time they come in, we don't, uh, get a, don't wanna get an echo. And I think that what I w that's what I would tell the fellows as well, don't get an echo every single time they come for even alarm. Some of those we can navigate by just clinical assessment. So yeah, you're absolutely right, I completely agree. <laughs> Any other questions? The, the echocardiography um, assessment, so actually we can address all the things but except for uh, the thrombus. Uh, so, so like low flow alarm, so maybe uh, due to thrombus. Mm -hmm. But as you uh, pointed out, uh, because of the uh, angle, mm -hmm. so the Doppler cannot align perfectly with uh, uh, the inflow and outflow. So we cannot address the thrombus mm -hmm. uh, concern. But other than that, T, uh, TR, AR, MR, and the septum can be, uh, including the pericardial effusion, can be adjusted by the echo. So in the situ situation of thrombus uh, concern mm -hmm. or low flow alarm, uh, how the echocardiography can do uh, better, improve? So I'll, I'll say the, the actual thrombi that form inside, is are inside the LVAD and um, out of like, like now I've been in practice for a couple of years and was a fellow for many years. I've only seen one case or two or you know, one or two cases which we actually found through CT scan, not echo. So in, in, for all practical purposes, you, it's next to rare, it's very rare for you to actually see a clot. Unless it's an aortic root thrombus that you can see when you give contrast imaging. But that too also doesn't always present with low flows. So if you're talking about thrombus, Echo uh, is not helpful. I wasn't going to say u useless, not helpful. So, <laughs> so thank you so much.